on RN, this is Bookmaster Day, I'm Michael Cathcart and today we're broadcasting live from the Melbourne Writers Festival. Welcome to you at home and welcome to the audience here at Melbourne's Federation Square. <laughs> For the next hour we'll be getting to know the young French writer Laurent Binet. He's become a literary superstar with his very, very first book. It's called H H H H. And it's the chilling story of a mass murderer named Reinhard Heydrich. We've all heard of Hitler, Himmler and Goering. Heydrich is less well known, and heaven knows why, because he was just as influential as they were. He was tall, blonde, clever and psychotically cruel. Hitler called him the man with the iron heart. The Czechs call him the butcher of Prague. This is also the story of two young Czech soldiers who killed him. Now, HHHH is a history book, but a history book that can't help behaving like a novel, because Binet is a historian who can't help or can't resist using a novelist's tricks and then castigating himself for lapsing into make-believe. And the result is a smart, funny and very chilling book. In 2010, it won France's most prestigious literary award, the Prix Goncourt, the English version is just out. The American novelist Brett Easton Ellis wrote HHHH Blew Me Away. I think I'm leaving out an H. HHHH, no I'm not. Blew Me Away. Binet's style fuses it all together. A neutral journalistic honesty sustained with a fiction writer's zeal and storytelling instincts. One of the best historical novels I've ever come across. At the Melbourne Writers Festival, would you please welcome Laurent Binet? <laughs> Nice to have you here. Welcome to Melbourne. Thank so you. tell us a bit about yourself, Laurent. Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Paris and I grew up in the suburb of Paris. And your parents, what did they do? They were and they are still teachers. Actually, my father, he's a, he's a history teacher. My mother used to be now. She's, a, she's working as director in a, in a school. Right. So she runs a school. Yes. Yeah. And what, what was your own education? Where did you go to school, university? Uh, well, I started to study uh, history, then I switched to join my friends who were studying literature, so I mixed. So you've always had this division in you, yeah. history on the one side and fiction on the other. Yes, actually. Yeah. And why did you switch to fiction? If you had history as a love at the start, what drew you over to the make-believe side? Actually, I didn't really um, switch to fiction because uh, when I was a young man, when I was 20, I was very influenced by the French surrealists, you know, the French surrealist poets. And they, they taught me um, not to trust the novels, you know, like never write, never write something like La Marquise sortit à 5 heures, you know, like... Um, just uh, fiction for fiction um, w was not very uh, interesting me, you know. So and why should we mistrust fiction? Explain to me in simple no, terms why to mistrust <coughs> fiction. It's not a question of mistrusting, but it's a question of interest, you know. I mean, I was never very interested by, um, I mean, to be interested by a fictional character, the, 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 the novelist has to be very, very good, you know, like, I was not very interested by the, the, the fate of a fictional character. I was, of course, I mean, many, uh, I loved many uh, fiction novels, but, I mean, you have to, you have to write something more than just a pale imitation yeah. of real. Well, I understand you know? what you're saying. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think what you're saying is it's hard to care a lot about someone who is imaginary. They're not actually going to get killed. They're not actually going to fall in love. That's not what's going to happen. There are real stories about real people. Is it the real stories that spoke to you as a young student? Yeah, well, I mean, <coughs> either it is a real story or it is not. And in that case, it has to be an extraordinary story, you know. But I think uh, a problem we have in, in France actually now is we are still, we, we, we've got that model of, realistic psychological novels, you know, uh, uh, from the, the, the 19th century time, which is still a, a big model for us, you know, and I think I'm not, what is sure is I'm not interested anymore by the Balzac style, you know, Balzac you know style of novels. what this reminds me of, your critique reminds me of, is the sorts of things that Brecht was saying about middle class theatre. You know, Brecht comes along and said the middle class go to the theatre and they enter a world of make-believe, which they think is real. 
And that stops them actually having a critical response to the world around them. So Brecht's response was to keep reminding the audience that they're in the theatre. This is, he wanted to remove the kind of truth effect of theatre. Yes, um, you're right. Um, I like that idea. I like that way to um, to play with the um, with the audience or with the reader, like telling a story and then suddenly making them believing in the story and then suddenly breaking the illusion. You know, and that's the reason why I I love so much Kundera. You know, for many years I didn't really understand why I loved Milan Kundera because he did that kind of novels. Um, really not fond of realistic yeah. psychological novels. Uh, but uh, what I love with him is suddenly he shows up as the author, not only uh, as the writer, not only the nar narrator, but as the, the author. He will speak as Kundera saying, yes, that character is not bad, but I'm not sure. And, you know, and yes. breaking, the, breaking that illusion. Let's talk about Kundera a little bit later. Because I think first we should get to know what this story is. So let's talk first about Reinhard Heydrich, what we know about him, who he was, and then talk in more detail about the way in which you've played with these philosophical questions which are so important to you and which have produced this wonderful book. So Reinhard Heydrich, um, how did you first hear about him? Well, I was a kid when my father told me about him um, he just he didn't give me uh, many details but he told me that once in Czechoslovakia two parachutists they uh, attempt to uh, the life of the headmaster of Gestapo you know and this is basically all I knew about him then when I was older I was sent to Slovakia to in order to make my military service and I remembered what my father told. So I'll just repeat that, because what you said was that these two partisans, two Czechoslovakian soldiers, they went out to kill Heydrich, who was the commander of the Gestapo. Yes, and also he was uh, the acting um, protector of former Czechoslovakia, former Czech Republic, actually. So the Nazis had gone into Czechoslovakia. They'd yeah. taken over a large yeah. section of it. And he was now actually, yeah, he was the government. He was the controller yes. of that yes. area so, of occupied Czechoslovakia. And so two, uh, two Czechoslovakian soldiers were sent from London uh, to kill him. At which they did. Yes, they which did. They yeah. you, spoiled the, well, <laughs> you spoiled the book, but they did. <laughs> that you can read the Wikipedia entry and you'll find out it's not it's history it's not fiction you're not supposed to play that game you just said this Laurent for those who are here at Melbourne's Federation Square on Books and Arts Daily uh, at the Melbourne Writers Festival there's a picture of Heydrich Reinhard Heydrich up on the screen behind us and I suppose we know that he's a Nazi so those narrow eyes look very cruel that mouth looks very hard and that long angular face looks unemotional and there's something very chilling about the fact that he looks so self-possessed there in his Nazi uniform. Um, what, what's his story? His, his second name was Tristan, which I guess is uh, a reference to Tristan and his older from Wagner's opera. Um, who, was, who was he? Where did he grow up? Yes, well, what's interesting with him is um, he, was, <laughs> he was one of the um, only Nazis who looked like a Nazi, you know, because Hitler, Himmler... <laughs> Goebbels, they didn't look as the <laughs> as the Nazi legend, you know. And so he, uh, um, I think Hitler likes liked him very much because of that. You know, he was tall, blonde. He was a musician. He was uh, he, his father was um, he was a violinist. Uh, he 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 came from um, a musician's family, you know. So he was really. Um, uh, fitting with uh, with the idea uh, Nazis they had uh, of themselves, uh, and uh, at the same time he became uh, he became the headmaster of the Gestapo. And what's interesting? I'm going to interrupt you there because headmaster is a word we use for schools. So the sorry, <laughs> the school is the headmaster. So let's say commander. Commander, the okay, the chief chief of chief, Gestapo. Yeah. You know, and what's interesting with him, he's not as uh, you said that he's not as famous as the others, and he's even not as famous as uh, Eichmann, for instance. Yeah. You know, uh, although Eichmann was just his r subordinate, his right right hand. You know, 
because uh, because he didn't have the, he didn't have the, the trial in Jerusalem, you know, and uh, he died earlier, and he was basically his occupation was uh, about secret services, and so he was not uh, under the spotlights as the others. But what's interesting is, uh, and this is what I didn't know when I started. Uh, uh, to be interested by that case and writing my book. Uh, he's following his career, he's uh, following um, every step, every stage of the Third Reich history because at every step of the Third Reich history, you find him, you know, like first the, the Knight of the Long Knives, he was in charge of, uh, of that operation, then the Crystal Knight, the Knight of the, the Crystal Knight, he was, uh, Goebbels uh, put him in charge. Well, you actually say he's one of the organizers of Kristallnacht. So this is yes, this night yes. in November. And, and, and um, um, uh, even more, he was uh, the organizer of the final solution. You know, he was the president at the Wannsee conference. So Kristallnacht, I, I guess we should just remind listeners what Kristallnacht was. There'll be some people who don't know this. It was, it, uh, basically, it was uh, an organized pogrom uh, in 38, uh, when uh, the the um, SA, the the um, uh, how do you say in English, the the says, but the others, you know, like um, I mean, the, basically the Nazis, the Nazis uh, they they, um, they they uh, they they run uh, all over the streets and destroyed the the shop of the Jews, you and, know, and breaking box. breaking the windows. That's why it was called the uh, crystal night because there's broken glass, like yeah, broken yeah, crystal yeah, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of those moments and when the true horror. It, it, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was a first big moment of violence against the Jews in '38. Mm. Do we know when he first? It started to express anti-Semitic ideas. Does it go right back to his childhood? Well, it's uh, yeah. What's what's funny is uh, his uh, father was suspected to be a Jew, and when he was at school, he was uh, mocked by the other kids because he was suspected to be a Jew. So it's very ironic that that boy, suspected to be a Jew, became the the organizer of the final solution. You know, uh, I, I th it's not quite clear when he showed his anti-Semitic mind, but uh, uh, wh what I learned is uh, his wife was a very, very uh, hard anti-Semitic uh, woman, so maybe he followed her, or maybe it was just you know the, the yeah. uh, atmosphere of the time. How did he get recruited into the Nazi hierarchy? What happened to make him such an important person? Yes, well, it's a strange story. First, he was in the army, in the Navy, actually, and he was fired because of a kind of scandal with a girl, you know. So he was unemployed uh, during the, the big crisis during the, th the 30s in Germany, and uh, to find a job, <laughs> he joined the, the SS, you know. Uh, but then he had the opportunity to apply uh, for building a secret service for Himmler, and uh, he didn't know a lot about it. He his experience was mostly from uh, the, the English detective books he read <laughs> about spy books, you know. Yeah. But it was enough to impress Himmler, who knew even less than him about Secret Service. So you can rely on the novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Across Australia, uh, <laughs> this is Books Nuts Daily. We're at the Melbourne Writers' Festival, and I'm talking to Laurent Binet about his astonishing book about a very cruel man uh, Mr. Herr Heydrich. The book is called H H H H, or in French, Ash 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 Ash. Why is it called this? Because it's it's an acronym. Uh, it was a kind of joke among the SS people. Uh, it means in German, it is uh, Himmler's Hirn heist Heydrich, meaning Himmler's brain is called Heydrich. And it was a joke among uh, SS people just to, to uh, in order to mean that uh, the, the, the real boss, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the real boss is more Heydrich, the s numbers, number two than the number one Himmler. Now, Heydrich is most infamous, infamous, I guess, as the Nazi officer who actually convened the Wannsee Conf Conference, which you mentioned earlier. This was in January 1942. So the Nazi hierarchy went to a villa on the shores of Lake Wannsee. Uh, and you say this is where the final solution was created. Well, uh, this is where, where the final solution was launched. You know, I mean, launched. it was already 
uh, it was uh, many Jews were killed already, but uh, in a more um, uh, artisanal way, you know, like shot by guns, which uh, was already, I mean, uh, more than one million, one million and a half Jews and uh, Tzigan died shot by guns or put inside some truck and, uh, you, you know, um, killed by gas. But after the Van Zee conference, it became, um, he, he, uh, the Van Zee conference gave to the final solution its uh, indus industrial dimension, you know, and after that started the uh, gas chambers in Auschwitz and uh, uh, the, after that um, the, the camps like Treblinka and Sobibor uh, were open. Yeah, and it was made into a, a really, a very impressive film, I thought, a telefilm a joint production between the BBC and HBO in which Kenneth Branagh played Heydrich. H have you seen that film? Yes, of course, I've seen it. And uh, it was very interested, uh, interesting because it was made by the, 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 the real text we, we got from that conference. Uh, but also, yes, uh, the, the, um, I, I liked the um, performance of Kenneth Branagh, although he was, I, I think, he looked um, dangerous, you know, and scary, but he was more uh, uh, polite and... Um, uh, easy than yeah. Heydrich was, I think. So it was an interesting performance, but not that uh, close to the real Heydrich. Well, that's interesting you say that because as we began our conversation, you were talking about the problem of the novel, that the novel feels real, and we want to, you want to question that. Historical documentaries like this one raise the same questions they, because they, they look authentic. They're very seductive while you're watching them because it appears that someone's taken a camera into the past. So the truth effect is even more seductive than the novel. No, not really because, I mean, you and I, we know uh, Kenneth Branagh as an actor. We, we, we know that it is not Heydrich talking. It is Kenneth Branagh playing Heydrich. So the illusion, uh, the illusion is not the same. I see. So you think the novel is more seductive as a truth experience, a truth illusion, than uh, a documentary. I think it is, yes. No, it's, a, it's a powerful point you make. Uh, so let's talk about this operation, Operation Anthropoid. Originally, I gather, you just set out to tell the story about this. So this, was, this is the operation to assassinate Heydrich. And as you were saying earlier, these two young men, a Czech and a Slovak, were given the task of assassinating him. How did they come into the story, into the real story? Uh, well, they were, I mean, uh, there, there were many uh, Slovak and Czech soldiers who didn't want to admit the defeat. And as, as it happened in France, they um, escaped to England, you know. And there, there were the, the free Czechoslovakian army and uh, the, free, uh, the free Czech Czechoslovakian government. They decided that operation. So there was a um, tough selection, and they, they they were selected to to mm. um, to, to, to be um, to, to go back to to their country uh, in order to kill uh, Heydrich, knowing that they would probably die. Yes, it was a uh, signed document that they knew that it was a suicide mission. But what's interesting and what is what's very moving is. Uh, they, they prepared, they planned the operation for five months, you know, and uh, um, they were helped by the local resistance and they got girlfriends involved in the um, local resistance. And uh, they, they knew that um, they would hardly, they, their chance to survive uh, were very low, but they wanted to try, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, they decided to wait for Heydrich's car in, in a curve, you know, and uh, to, to, to kill him in the car. And uh, they, they, um, in their preparation, uh, they, they um, how to say, uh, they, they, they had studied the, the, um, the, road. the road, the road, and uh, they could see that every two days, I mean, it was not regular, but sometimes he had uh, an escort with him, and sometimes he had not. And uh, the right day of the assassination, they didn't know if there would be an escort or not, and if there would have been an escort, they would be killed uh, in, uh, yes, during, during the assassination, during the attempt. 
if there were if there were not an escort, if there was not an escort, they would have a little chance to escape. And so it's, I mean, it's, it's just a bet, you know. And there was no escort, so they they um, they, um, they injured him. They didn't kill him straight, but they injured him, and they could escape. And then started that amazing runaway for three weeks during Prague. You know, all the Reich forces were looking after them. And uh, after three weeks, they were hiding in a, in a church in the middle of Prague, you know, really in the center of Prague. And uh, they were betrayed by a friend of them, an, another parachutist, uh, for money. And uh, one morning, uh, they were hiding in the crypt of that church. And one morning, they, were, they woke up and they were surrounded by uh, 700 uh, SS men mm. and started an amazing assault, which lasted seven hours, seven people against 700. I've just put on the screen here at the Melbourne Writers' Festival a German stamp that was issued, and uh, it's actually the death mask of Heydrich. It's a powerful image. Sorry? It's a very powerful image, this. Yes, well, I mean, he was, uh, as I told you, he was um, he was the, the ideal Nazi, so they, they, they made that uh, that death mask after his death, and uh, this is on the stamp, you know, so he became a kind of um, national hero uh, after his death. The book includes some really shocking details about Nazi cruelty, as if we needed any more. You, you tell the story about a football match, or a soccer match, that the Nazis organized in Ukraine, occupied Ukraine. Can you tell us that story about what they did? Yes, it was a total uh, degradation because it had nothing to do with Heydrich, but it's, it was so amazing that I had to to tell that story. Uh, they, they, in Kiev, in Ukraine, it, Ukraine was occupied, and the Nazis, they, uh, they organized a kind of uh, Champions League um, with all the, the occupied countries, you know, and uh, it, it happened that the best team was Ukrainian team from Kiev, basically the, the former Dynamo Kiev, and uh, the Nazis, they, they heard about that team beating Hungary and Slovakia, and so they sent their best team uh, from the Wehrmacht to, 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 have a, to have a match against that Ukrainian team, and uh, at the halftime, the Ukrainian team was winning, and at, uh, during the, the halftime, um, the, the commander of Kiev, the German commander of Kiev, went to see the team and told, uh, told them, okay, you play very well, but if you win, uh, you'll be executed. So it was um, a dilemma. And of course, in, in, at that time, it's, that match meant something as a symbol, of course. So the, the, the Ukrainian team, they decided to play and they won. And they were not killed uh, at that time because the German, they wanted their revenge. So after the second match, they won again. The Ukrainian team won again. And uh, it was a big furry uh, in the stadium. Uh, the, 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 the people, the crowd was on fire. And the, 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 the German uh, had to shoot uh, to, to, uh, you know, to control the situation. And they grabbed all the team but three. And they killed them. Uh, they, killed, they executed them all. Uh, about three who could, uh, of the team who could escape. Mm. It's, it's called, uh, s still now, it's called a death match in Ukraine. And in front of the stadium of the Dynamo Kiev, the, the actual team, there is, a, the, 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 there is a board with, that, uh, with the commemoration of the, that story. And the Nazis also showed how brutal they were in the revenge they took on the Czech villages of the two men who had... Uh, as assassinated Heydrich. Tell us that story. Yes, the reprisal, the retra retaliation was um, was awful after the after the assassination, uh, especially because the Nazis they had no link, they had no lead, they they couldn't find the the, um, the, the parachutists, you know. So they got mad, and uh, they they they, um, they they got uh, they got they got a lead which was a fake one. Uh, they heard about that village, Lidice. Uh, that which would could be involved in the assassination. So they came and they took all the men and they shot the, all the men 
and they deported the 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 women the, the women were gassed and most of the children too except few children who were blonde enough to be adopted in germany by a uh, Germ german family and it it remained i mean you know it was just 200 people which is nothing compared to the millions of people who died during the second world war but at that time it was a big shock uh, in the in the country and all over the world actually because the nazis they they wanted to show they they, they made publicity about that m murder that uh, village destruction because they wanted to show you can't play with them you know so they wanted to show their strength but they showed uh, to Uh, all the world, their their cru cruelness and br brutality, you know. So it was it was um, in all um, uh, in terms of propaganda, it was a kind of turn that that uh, Lidice uh, affair, uh, that uh, Lidice de destruction. Because after that, nobody all over the world, nobody could say that okay, yes, uh, maybe we can deal with Nazis. Mm -hmm. On RN, this is Books and Arts Daily with Michael Cathcart. We're coming live to you this morning from the Melbourne Writers' Festival where I'm on stage with the French writer Laurent Binet and we're talking about his book HHHH, which is the story of the life and the death of Reinhard Heydrich. Now, uh, Laurent, you could have told the story in the book in the way you've told it to us here this morning, just as a factual account. These are all established facts. There's not much contest or debate about them. But instead, you engage in a much more complex form of storytelling. And uh, as you explained at the start, you're holding a constant conversation with the reader. Um, can we talk some more about Milan Kundera? Because you are in dialogue with him quite a lot, I think. I mean, Kundera writes a lot about the fate of the individual under the totalitarian rule of communism. And your book has similar concerns, but under the under the control of another form of totalitarianism. Can you talk more about what drew you into this conversation with Kundera? Well, uh, as I told you, I mean, I just, I realized that what I like with uh, Kundera is that he didn't, uh, he breaks the rules of the novel, showing him up um, Uh, as as uh, as the author, you know, during uh, du during the story, you know. Um, so this this is as a reader, um, I love that, you know. I, I love uh, uh, that feeling that the, the writer is talking to me uh, directly, you know. So as a writer, uh, I just made uh, I just used the same way. Mm. <laughs> so you tell us in the book that you're not going to make things up, but you keep. Then you keep making things up. So I'll just read a short section, if you don't mind, to just give the, the audience and the listeners a, a feel for the kind of thing you do. So you've described a scene. It doesn't really matter what the scene is, but you've described one. And then you say this. That scene, like the one before it, is perfectly believable and totally made up. How impudent of me to turn a man into a puppet, a man who's been dead for a long time who cannot defend himself, to make him drink tea, when it might turn out that he liked only coffee, to make him put on two coats when perhaps he only had one, to make him take the bus when he could have taken the train, to decide that he left in the evening rather than the morning. I am ashamed of myself, he said. <laughs> And then you go on, but I've said that I don't want to write an historical handbook. This story is personal. That's why my visions sometimes get mixed up with the known facts. It's just how it is. Now, this really is the tantalizing and perhaps the problem with the book. Let's compare your book with a book that I know has sold very well in France by um, an American novelist called Jonathan Little, or Littell, I guess it is, called The Kindly Ones, which mixed Greek mythology with the story of the Holocaust. Now, this is a book that came out in 2006, and it was very popular. People in France love this book. They, they spoke about it as if it told you what life was really like in the war. And I often hear people say things like this. I read the novel and it showed me what it really must have been like. And you have a problem with that reading. Yes, because, I mean, um, th that there is an issue with that book, The Kindly Ones, because he invented um, that main character, which is... Uh, You know, I, it's a kind of monologue interior, uh, monologue interior, yeah, you interior monologue. Uh, lasting 900 pages of uh, fictional, uh, fictional Nazi, you know, fictional SS, 
which I believe never existed, uh, I mean, and which I believe uh, was never close to, to, to exist, I mean, to, to real SS, you know. So if it's a fantasy, uh, it's, I have no problem. But the, the, my problem was the reception. Like, as you said, people said, okay, if you want to understand the Second World War, you have to read this book. It's better than a historical book. And I disagree with that because that, that, that character, that fictional character, is not as any real SS, but he's exactly as Nazis. They wanted to show themselves, you know. So he's, uh, that character, Max Auer, it's his name, is really like the legend, not like mm. history, you know. And of course it disturbed me because then there is a, there could be a source of confusion, you know, which, um, yeah, it disturbs me, definitely. Jo Jonathan Little's response was that he was dealing in what he called novelistic truth. Yeah, well, I don't buy that. I mean, that's <laughs> novelistic truth. I mean, you know, <laughs> in that way, I mean, anything can be truth, you know, like just the truth of, I mean, the, the, the truth is a big word, you know. I, I don't like that big word, you know, like um, I prefer to use veracity. Veracity, I don't know. If yeah, veracity I, is good. Veracity, you know, like... Either it happened or it didn't, you know, so, but truth, you know, metaphysical truth, uh, truth of love, truth of, I, I don't know what is, I mean, you know, you know, like novelistic truth, I mean, just tell me what, what do you think, uh, what does it mean, that novelistic truth? Well, don't ask me, I didn't use the term, <laughs> you're putting me on the spot. I mean, if, if we... <laughs> Like, I mean, you know, uh, you can write, you can write a story, uh, like, you can imagine that... Germans, they won in Stalingrad. And I have no problem with that. I, I love the, those kind of stories, but it's not novelistic truth. It's called, there is a technical word for that. It's called Uchronia. Uchronia? Uh, no, I guess we call it speculative Uchronia. fiction. So the idea that you're speculating on what might yeah, have been, yeah. let's imagine that the Germans yeah, won okay, the so war. What if, let's what imagine, if stories? You know, yeah, what if, what stories? if the okay. Dutch or the French had settled Australia? Okay, but so it's, I mean, for me, it's, it has nothing to do with truth, you know, it's just, it's, it's fantasy, it's yeah. fantasy of, of fiction. We often but talk about the novelist as if he or she has a kind of mystical insight into historical figures. I often hear people talk about Hilary Mantel in that way. I don't know whether you've read Hilary Mantel, but, I you'll, read her, but, I but you'll know, her. you'll know the issue. Yeah. So, um, Hilary Mantel takes this real historical figure, Thomas Cromwell, about whom, about whose private life we know very little, and she writes about what he's thinking, what he's doing, what his motives are. Um, and although this is an astonishing book, and it's an astonishing piece of writing, there is part of me that says, uh, I don't know what the truth claim here is. Because when people tell me it's an incredible insight into the life of this man, Thomas Cromwell, I think, well, but you are making it up. So, so are we to say through some mystical relationship the novelist is able to tell the truth that isn't actually in the documents? Or do we, are we able to kind of make a division as we read and say, we know these are the facts that, or the, you know, the details of the real world, and I just accept that I can read your book as though there's a bit over here which I know you made up. Do you have the same, the same issue? Yes, I don't know, but as a, ma as a matter of fact, you, uh, as I am, you are interested by what is true or what is not true, you know, when, you, I mean, it's, it's the same when, when, when I go to see a, a historical movie, you know, I mean, the first thing I, I hear uh, among the audience w when I go out of the theater, you know, like I hear always the same questions, like people s y used to say, yeah, this was a great movie, but I wonder if that scene was made up or not, you know, so it, it is, uh, I mean, as a matter of fact, it is an interesting question. And uh, uh, let's say, you know, I mean, when I read, let's say, War and Peace by Tolstoy, you know, it's a great book, of course. It's a great novel, but I don't read it to learn about Napoleon, you know, the, Napoleon as a historical figure, you know. I read it for other reasons, which have nothing to do with history, you know. So this is um, this is my point, you know. I mean, if you want to learn about Nazis, 
uh, I, I don't advise. Uh, I advise you not to read uh, the kindly well, ones. War and no. Peace is exactly the same situation because War and Peace takes you inside the mind of Napoleon. Yes, but mostly, I mean, I, I, I don't believe I'm inside the mind of Napoleon. I feel I'm inside the mind of Tolstoy, <laughs> which is very different. <laughs> which is which is still a great place to be. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's a clear philosophical position you've taken, and yet. Laurent, this is a book in which you make things up. You use all the techniques of the novel. So you're a person who is constantly being tempted to make things up. Unlike a historian, my own profession is as a historian, I'm never tempted to make things up. I don't think. I don't think I am. If I want to say it's a dark and stormy night, I will go to the library and check the newspaper to see if it was indeed a dark and stormy night on the 3rd of September 1945. I won't just say it was a dark and stormy night. But you keep saying, oh, I have this urge to imagine what it was like as he was walking down the street. What was his body language like? What was his mood? Mood that day, and then you write. Oh, I mustn't do that. Um, I mustn't make these things up. And you do it again and again and again. Why did you allow yourself to break the rule like this? Well, I guess because I'm a divided person, you know. And uh, so this, I, I had to cont uh, c contain contain my uh, novelist part, you know, and um, uh, because it was in contradiction of my project, uh, which was. <laughs> to tell the true story, but um, s soon, I mean, I realized that this is a com complicated project, you know, and uh, um, th I, it's true that I had that temptation, and from time to time, I just gave up with that temptation, so I made up a few, uh, few things, because it was very frustrating not to know. So I was fully aware it was in contradiction with my, my project, and uh, you're right, I should have suppressed those ch chapters, but... No, I don't think you should have suppressed no, it. Yes, you wouldn't have written I, this marvellous book. But the reason why I didn't is, uh, in, in French, we used to say, uh, you know, when you, uh, I, I, want the, I want butter and the money of the butter, you know. So I, I, I want to... Which, which is the same expression in English as uh, you want to have your cake and yes, eat it too. Yes, in French, yes. you say, is it vouloir le beurre et l'argent du beurre, du beurre right. to, to have your... So I, 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 I wanted I wanted uh, the cake of history and to eat the, the the novel, you know. I mean, to to feel the taste of of novel, you know. So what I did is from time to time I broke up my own rules, you know, and I made up um, I made up things. For for instance, when I when I knew that Heydrich was um, flying over Russia during Barbaros Barbarossa operation. He was shot by the, the anti-aircraft uh, Soviet system, you know. And uh, I, I, I just, I wanted, I mean, I wanted to know about that uh, plane, uh, plane battle, you know, and I didn't know about it and I couldn't help myself. I just invented it, you know. So, and I knew it was bad according to my rules. But as I mean, as a boy, you know, I wanted that plain battle, you know. So instead of suppressing the chapter, I, I let uh, um, um, I, I left it in the book, and then I uh, uh, the chapter after I de deconstructed uh, the, the, what I did, you know. Yeah. So uh, those those chapters, uh, when I made up um, a, a story or a scene. Uh, I, I used the, those chapters um, as an illustration to discuss uh, the problematic of, of my book, which was how to tell a true story and to show how complicated it was. On RN, this is Books and Arts Daily. We're at the Melbourne Writers' Festival talking to Laurent Binet about his book HHHH, which is the story of the life and the assassination of the Nazi leader Reinhard Heinrich. It's also the story of Laurent's own struggles with fiction and with, well, I guess with truth-telling or with veracity, <laughs> as, uh, as you've taught us to say. What have you learnt? This is your first history book. What have you learnt about the writing of history from this experience? That is a very complicated job, you know, and uh, I, uh, I admire um, historians like you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> How did you organise your research materials? Did you 
Did you put it onto cards? Did you write them in files in your computer? How did you just make sense of all the material that you have to gather? Uh, I was not very well organized. I read a lot of documentation. And um, I, um, I wrote all the chapters uh, not in the chronological order. You know, like it was... Uh, at the end, I, when, I, when I had all my chapters, I thought I had finished writing my book. Uh, having 250 chapters and something, you know, but then I discovered it was not finished at all because I had to uh, uh, organize, yeah, organize it uh, yeah. and to to uh, to decide the order of the chapters, you know, and so it was a very very uh, complicated job to just to yeah. because I mean you know it was uh, I had to decide when I insert some chapter from the present time between two uh, historical chapters. It was very, very uh, long and complicated. When you say job. chapters, they make them sound very long, but the book is written in little numbered sections. Yeah, there are yeah. no page numbers in this book. There's, it's like a Kundera novel. There are simply a series of numbered items, and it goes... Yeah, that was the decision months. of my English publisher. I mean, in all the other countries, we have pages is numbers. Oh. Yeah. oh, I think it's a good idea. I like yeah, it. Yeah, I, I love um, it. I mean, it's so, I think it's so British, you know. <laughs> so British not to have page numbers. <laughs> I don't know, a contentious claim, Laurent. Um, you know, the biggest challenge for people who set out to write a history is they discover that everything is connected to everything else. And so they don't know how to put a frame or a boundary around their research or their story. I've helped so many people on history projects who become distressed because they think I can't tell my story because I need to know about this and then that and the French, you know, the first, world, the first World War, you need to understand that to make sense of the Second World War and on it goes. Did you find that a problem, everything connected to everything Yes, else? definitely, yes. I mean, um, I thought, it took me 10 years to write the book actually and uh, I thought I would never finish it, you know, it was an endless uh, job. What I did is... Uh, Everything. I mean, I found everything interesting, you know, even the, the little details or li little um, um, uh, connected story, uh, peripheric story. Yeah. story. Um, so what I did from time to time, I, I, I gave a beginning of a story and uh, hoping that, you know, I, I was just throwing uh, bases for peripheric story, hoping that maybe someone else will uh, pick it up and write other books about uh, all the secondary stories uh, I mentioned in, in my book, you know. I, I mean, I like... Uh, uh, this is another Kundera's idea, you know, like um, thinking about literature and uh, novelist as a, as a ch chain, you know, link, you know, like... Uh, and, and I like to think I'm a part of a chain. There were people before me talking about Heidrich, you know, and hopefully there will be other people, other writers, other hist historians after me who will, who will write after my, uh, my, my book. I think that's a great insight because people often talk about a history book as if it should be definitive, if, if it should tell something that is, you might say, the whole truth. But all history books are in conversation yes, of course. with people's memories and with other historians. And... I, I guess the, the, the issue that I find interesting about history is that, especially in the context of a festival where fiction is the dominant form, people talk about history, often they talk about a dry history book. They talk about a boring history book, as though history itself needs to be kind of gingered up by, by invention or by, by, fic, by fictional creation. But of course, what animates the information in a book is the argument. That's where, in a traditional history book, the book really takes flight because the historian has got something to say, has got a thesis to develop. I mean, one of my favourite books, history books as it happens, is a French book by uh, Alain Corbin, which is a classic book called The Foul and the Fragrant, the, the Miasme La Jonquille, which perhaps you know, and it's a history of smell. Yeah, I heard about it, and actually uh, it was one of my teachers when I was studying uh, history at oh, La with him? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, he's, it's, it's he's a great guy. Yeah. So, so to come in, that's where the personal comes in, because you say, I'm going to do something I bet you've never thought of. I'm going to write a history of smell. But of course, and I mean, I disagree. I know, I know uh, many uh, historical books which are um, very interesting. And on the other side, um, many novels are very boring. <laughs> well, that's, that's right. That's right. 
I'm not, I'm not, by the way, taking sides here with one form or another. We're just engaging in this debate about about fiction and truth and and uh, historical fiction, the historical novel, which will be a theme we return to here on Books and Arts Daily uh, throughout the Writers Festival. Now, in the book, you describe yourself as the son of a Jewish mother and a communist father, brought up on the republican values of the most progressive French petit bourgeoisie and immersed through my literary studies in the humanism of Montaigne, the philosophy of the Enlightenment, the Surrealist Revolution, and the existentialist worldview. That's a very complicated <laughs> mixture. I, I, I just, I, you have to explain why I said that. It was just to, I, I wanted to, to, to explain that I'm not supposed to become a Nazi after, you know, all that <laughs> years uh, working on Heydrich, you know. So, I did not, you know, like to. But nevertheless, it's usually true that that a person believes one or two core truths about, or holds to one or two principles that they believe to be true. Out of that mixture of your influences, can you talk about what are the kind of values about life that you hold to be the most important? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, honesty is uh, w w one of the, the the main values I believe in. You know, and it's true that. I mean, few girlfriends of mine uh, would tell you that I can be a liar, you know. But <laughs> but I I don't I mean I don't like um, lie as a principle, you know. And I don't like yeah I mean I don't like falsification, you know. Uh, so um, um, I I I don't like. People pretend uh, sell you something they are not. You know, people pretend they are something and they are not. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm so obsessed with history about um, what is true or not. Um, f for instance, now, yeah, in France we discuss a lot about the 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 femen, you know, the f uh, the, the girls who <laughs> show their breasts. Uh, uh, the feminists. F feminists, yes. Yeah. And uh, last time on Twitter... I assume those are the girls that show the rest you're talking about. I mean, <laughs> but press on. And last time on Twitter, I could see someone saying, yes, they are always uh, demonstrating against Islam, but never against um, Catholicism, you know? Right. And it was not <laughs> definitely not true because they made a demonstration in Notre Dame, in the in the main church in Paris, you know. And so I just, whatever you think about the femens, you know, I just I, it disturbs me that uh, the, the, you, you base your your um, uh, what you think about them, about that movement, you base it on a lie or a mistake, you know. It just it, I, I don't know why, it just it makes me uh, disturbed, uh, mm. not comfortable. So. In August last year, you published another book, which I don't think is in English yet, available in English, which in English would be called Nothing Goes As Planned, uh, which, well, tell us about this. You went behind the scenes of a political campaign. Yes, well, I mean, uh, I, um, it started uh, with um, an American show, actually. I loved uh, the West Wing, you know, the, the American show, you know. And so uh, there were... As you may know, there were presidential elections last year in France, and I thought, well, I would like to to uh, to see what is it uh, from behind. So I asked um, the, the 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 candidate François Hollande if I can follow him and write about the campaign, and he said yes, and then he <laughs> won the election. And I wrote that book, and I published that, that, that book about the, the, the campaign, the French campaign. And what were the key ideas that you were exploring? I didn't, I mean, I wanted to check if it's like, uh, like what I've seen in the West Wing or not. And, <laughs> and actually, it was quite close. I mean, <laughs> We've probably got time, uh, just as we wind up here, for some questions, audience questions. So if the person who's got the microphone here in the room can put their hand up. Where's the microphone person? We're on Books and Arts Daily here on RN. And so just uh, there's a question here right in the middle. So just pass the microphone along to the chap in the middle here. This is Books and Arts Daily on RN. You're on Radio National with Michael Cathcart. And we're at the Melbourne Writers' Festival talking to Laurent Binet about his uh, book H-H-H-H, four H's. And uh, we've now gone to audience questions. 
Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, ask you a few details about the trust that the the um, uh, leading Germans had amongst each other. And from what I've read about Heinrich, he always, uh, he always uh, uh, you know, has appealed to me as... As you were, uh, just Hold the microphone right on your mouth and keep this brief because <laughs> just, we're just as you explained him. But I believe he had a dossier on Hitler, and also Goering had a dossier on Hitler, and all, and probably him more than a whole lot. And this was their insurance policy. And when he was dying, I believe Hitler sent his his uh, doctor out to see if he could uh, make him live a bit longer. But I'm, there's a conspiracy theory that he might have sent that doctor, who wasn't very good. <laughs> to make his life a bit uh, shorter. What do you, what, what's your opinion of that? There, there is a lot of theories uh, about such conspiracies, you know. Uh, another one is uh, that Churchill wanted to kill uh, Heydrich because he was afraid that uh, Heydrich could replace Hitler and then it would be, uh, maybe it would be complicated to fight Germans till the end because some countries, maybe America, would uh, agree to, to make peace with Germany, you know. So, well, this, this sounds to me as um, um, sounds many uh, conspiracy theories, you know, like very adoptable. Uh, I think what is true is the first thing, uh, after Heydrich died, the first thing Himmler did was to send someone, maybe he went uh, himself, to Heydrich House in <laughs> Germany, collecting all, uh, all the all, all the all the files, you know, <laughs> like. Um, but I think, uh, yes. Well, I mean, I, I would need more infos about that theory to to, to, to buy it. You know, I, it sounds. Yeah, it sounds. Uh, Let's go to one more question. We've just got a minute to go, so very briefly, please. Laurent, I'm wondering what effect all that research had on you. So there you are dealing yeah. with a terrible cruelty. Yeah, how did it affect you? Well, I mean, it's um, uh, it's true that from time to time I didn't sleep very well, you know, and uh, it happened to me. Uh, I was dreaming of Heydrich, and it was uh, quite scaring dreams. But at the same time, uh, I was definitely uh, interested by the Second World War history, and it was not that that story, uh, that specific story, was not that depressing because um, because it's not very often that uh, it, actually it's the only time such a prominent Nazi, such Nazi important Nazi, was killed. You know, during all the Second World War, Hitler escaped uh, of more than 20 uh, attempts, uh, assassination attempts, you know, and so this, this assassination attempt is the only one uh, who succeeded during all the Second World War. So in a way, it was um, stimulating, you know, and not that depressing. That's where we'll have to draw proceedings to a close. Ladies and gentlemen, would you thank Laurent Binet? <laughs> H, 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 H is published by Random House in Australia. This session was supported by the Institut Francais. And Laurent is speaking at the Sydney Jewish Writers Festival on Thursday, the 29th of August at 8 p.m. And you'll find full details at the Sydney Jewish Writers Festival website. And that concludes uh, Books and what's this show called Book Nuts Daily on RN for this week thanks to our executive producer Linda Lapresti and to the whole team for another great week um, do get well Rhiannon I know you're at home listening and uh, not too well uh, the Bush Telegraph is next if you're listening to us live at 11am Margaret Throsby is coming up if you're listening in the wee small hours and just coming up to the 3am news. I'm Michael Cathcart saying farewell from the Melbourne Writers' Festival. I'll be back with more of the festival next week. Across Australia, this is RN. We're coming up to news time. <laughs>